Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Bridge Drive-In Service. Happy Mother's Day, moms. We love you guys so much. Thank you for being here with us this morning. We're going to get started with a little bit of worship, celebrating Jesus together. Let's do that now.
When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to
Father, I am so. 
Thank you, Jesus. We are so, so thankful, grateful to be called your sons and daughters. We love you. We welcome you here this morning and ask that you would be glorified. You are good. You are faithful. You are a good father. We love you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Weren't they great? You know, I, 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 love, I love the honking of the horns. I feel like some of you um, are even more expressive in the safety of your car, you know? You, you're kind of, yeah, there you go. All of a sudden, we all become Pentecostal, you know, from the inside of our car. So I love it. Great. So glad to have you. It's exciting to just be at the same place, at the same time, with people that I love. And uh, thank you for all the hard work, the band and everybody that doing the setup and all our ushers and all the work that went into providing the service. I want to let you know we're going to do this again next Sunday. We're going to be having drive-in church one more time. And, of course, you know, I think the following Sunday, we're going to be, we have permission to be back in the building with limited capacity. And so we'll be communicating with you some of the details, but uh, what we're planning on at this point is doing our regular service times of 9 and 11, two weeks from today. Um, and uh, I think we're supposed to be at 33% capacity. What we're kind of counting on is that not everybody's going to want to rush back and be in church. And so we're anticipating that the attendance will be lower and uh, that we'll, we'll stay under that 33% threshold. Um, just kind of naturally. And uh, I just want you to know that it's okay to stay home. 
when we open back up. If you have underlying health issues, it's probably best that you do stay at home and watch online. We'll still be broadcasting. We might even be broadcasting on the FM station in the parking lot. So if you want to like almost come into church, you can just park your car and sit here and kind of do your own drive-in church thing without the stage. But um, we'll give you all the details as, uh, as we formulate a plan and a strategy for this. But it's just so good to be here together today. And once again, we had the report, and it's supposed to rain yet later today. But again, God is good, and it's holding off so far. So we're grateful for that. We want to welcome everybody who might be here for the first time or possibly watching online for the first time here at the bridge. We have a gift that we would like to give to you. And so if you'll take down some information or act on this information as I give it right now, if you will take out your phone and text the word welcome to the following number, we will send you a gift. Well, first, there will be a form that will appear. You click on, there will be a link that you click on, and you fill out a form online and push, submit, or send, or whatever it says, and then we'll get this out to you locally, but served locally. Wonderful coffee. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to go to Costa Rica to get the coffee. Okay, so, uh, so anyway, great coffee. Christian folks, you'll love it. Just to say thank you, moms, for being great, wonderful, and um, celebrate your day. Um, maybe you've been following us on Facebook. I sure hope so, because we have been working really hard. I just noticed these are the mugs. I didn't know they were up here. There you go. Okay. I'm out of practice. Um, we have been, um, what was I talking about before I interrupted myself? Oh, yeah, on Facebook. We have been working real hard to stay connected on Facebook. And, um, and this month, the entire month of May, we're doing a Bible study of the book of Proverbs by reading one chapter per day, corresponding a, one of the chapters to the day of the month, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, whatever day of the month it is read that chapter and then go on Facebook and just log on your thoughts about it. what verse spoke to you. What did you uh, like about this chapter? And it's just a way to interact with, with each other and stay connected. And of course, uh, Vince and I are doing a daily devotion, so you can log on to that. We go live mo several days out of the week, 11 a.m. And uh, so hope, you, hope you're logging on and uh, joining us for that. Um, at this time, we're going to just Worship one more time. Is the band coming back on or not? Okay. Okay, we're going we're gonna to pray God's blessing upon the sermon that's coming up and uh, ask him to bless our gifts, our offerings, however you can give online or sending by mail. I want to say again, I can't say it enough, thank you for your faithfulness. You guys have been incredible. I want to tell you something. We did a comparison of the first of the, the five weeks prior to the coronavirus shutdown, we tabulated the total income for the five weeks leading up to the shutdown. And then we tabulated the five weeks after the shutdown. You want to know something? We were $10,000 ahead during the shutdown. I think, I think that qualifies us for like the greatest church in the world. <laughs> or close to it. I can't even, you know, and I know that it's, it's not because everybody has been able to give the way they would want to, but some people in light of the situation has said, I'm going to give more. I'm going to just do, go above and beyond for the good of the church. And so you guys have helped us tremendously, and we've been able to continue to meet all of our expenses. And when this thing finally winds down, and we get to get back to whatever normal is going to look like, we're going to be in good shape moving forward. And so thank you again. And I want to do take the time to pray um, for this whole epidemic, pandemic thing, because it's not over. You know that. And when we start meeting, it's not over. We still have to be careful. We have to follow the guidelines because it's for our good and it's for the good of others that we do that. And uh, we just want to pray that, that uh, this will come to an end. 
and that God will bring good out of it because he can do that, all right? So let's join together and pray right now. Father, first I want to thank you for just the faithfulness of your people, the support that we've had, Lord. It's just amazing, and I thank you for each and every one who has, Lord, stepped up, done what they could, and some, Lord, even beyond what they could do. And just, God, we just pray your blessing upon each and every one. And we pray, God, that when we get back into a more normal type of uh, services, that we will just, that, that we'll just accelerate, we'll just explode into new ministries, reaching more people for you, Lord, and just doing all the good that you would have us to do. Lord, you've, you've blessed us greatly, and that brings with it great responsibility. And so, Father, we want to do the best we can with what you've given us. And Father, we do pray that this coronavirus would come to an end that, Father God, that you would intervene, that you, your healing power would be at work, Lord, to bring relief to the suffering, healing to the sick and ravaged bodies around the world, and that, God, that you would use this, Lord, to turn hearts and minds to you and just reveal your glory for your spirit out upon this world, Lord. And, Father, we pray your blessing upon the ministry of your word today. We thank you for Vince and for the message that's coming forth. Be with him in a mighty way, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, Flicker, you're bright if you can hear me. Can you all hear me? Great, 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 great. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you all. Welcome to the Bridge Drive-In Church Service. So cool to see so many of you full parking lot full of people we know that many people are watching online as well at home so hello to everybody watching online at home you are not a second class citizen we are all together this morning celebrating Jesus and learning together from his word we are kicking off a new series today called identity theft stay with me in your car this series is called I can hear it very faintly from the front to the back say it with me this series is called identity theft. There you go, there you go. It's kind of a weird thing to say out loud because it's kind of a negative image, right? But this series is not about how to avoid your credit card information getting stolen online, although that would maybe be a good thing to learn as well because we all have experienced things like that, people trying to hack us, etc. This series is actually about one of the big challenges and struggles of the Christian life, which is the reality that Satan is always trying to steal our identity in Christ. Now technically you can't because through the blood of Jesus our identity in Christ is secure but Satan is always trying to steal and rob us of our awareness of our identity in Christ. This whole series is going to be about identifying Satan's strategies to steal our identity so that we can block and stop and prevent him from doing that and live out of our identity in Christ. Now, I know that some of you, you're like, cool, I'm excited. But a lot of you are like, oh, man, I've been coming to church for a while. I've been doing this thing a while, and I hear people saying, put your identity in Christ. And I'm always like, yes, yes, I will do that. And then in your head, you're like, what does that even mean? What does it mean to put your identity in Christ? And you've been around the church world too long that you feel too awkward to ask anybody you're like, I'm just going to keep nodding along because this is such a commonly used phrase, but I have no idea what it means to put my identity in Christ. So as we talk about how Satan's going to try to steal our identity in Christ, you're going to be totally lost. So I want to actually start this whole series, series before we look at the strategy Satan's going to use that we're going to examine today of how he tries to steal our identity in Christ. I want to just start by giving a definition of what it means to be a Christian who has your identity identity in Christ. As simply as I can define it, when your identity is in Christ, you define yourself by the statement, I am a child of God. You define your identity by the reality, I am a child of God. God says, you are my beloved and you live out of that identity. I am a person loved by God. Because if you're a Christian, when you gave your life
life to Jesus, all of your sin, past, present, and future, was forgiven. So now, living out of that identity of an accepted by God person, you are free of shame, you're free of guilt, you're free of condemnation, you are whole and complete, and everything you think, everything you say, everything you feel, everything you do flows out of that reality that you are a child of God. What this ends up looking like in terms of like a final product is you are a person who is filled with confidence and humility. That's a rare person, isn't it? There are very few Christians that live that way, and the reason is because there are very few Christians that have fully embraced the reality of what it means to be a child of God. You're full of confidence because the God of the universe knows your name and is on your side, and he loves you. Why should you worry about criticism or trials or the ups and downs of life? You can be confident each and every day knowing that God is on your side and loves you and cares for you as you are. But you're also filled with humility because you know that you didn't get that way based on your own performance. You didn't become a child of God because you're such a great person. In fact, you came to God just like I came to God, broken, sinful, a horrible person like we all are, falling short of the standard of God, but not because of how good we are, but because of how good God is. We are accepted and loved and embraced by Him. So we're humble, knowing all that I am is a gift from God, but we're confident knowing all that I am is a gift from God. I don't have to earn it. I don't have to keep it. It is given to me once and for all. That is an unstoppable person. That is an unstoppable Christian. A Christian who has embraced their identity in Christ, lives life whole and complete from a place of emotional strength and solidity that looks different than anything else in the world. Amen? That, that is my hope for all of us that we learn to live out of our identity in Christ. There's nothing that God wants for you more than to live out of that identity and embrace that identity, and there's nothing that Satan wants for you less. Satan is always attacking, going after, and trying to block our perception of our identity in Christ. So each week, we're going to look at one of Satan's main strategies so we can see it coming and shut it down. So the strategy, the first strategy that we're going to look at today is a common one that many of you have experienced, I've experienced, I battle it on a daily basis, many of you battle it on a daily basis, and that is Satan's strategy of introducing competing identities. So we all, if we're Christians, have our identity as child of God, and what Satan does to try to get us off of this is to introduce a competing identity. If you picture a big whiteboard with a big square on it, and at the top it says, your name's identity, Vince's identity, Carol's identity, Ron's identity, God writes in a box, my child, and then Satan writes in, other identities that distract us from that one. Now you might think the competing identities that Satan would introduce would be the opposite, right? So God says, you are my beloved child, and Satan says, you are a dirty, rotten piece of filth that doesn't deserve anything good in life, and God hates you. And that sometimes is one of Satan's strategies, and we're going to cover that angle one of these weeks. But when we talk about competing identities today, we're actually going to be talking about identities that we see as positive, that we see as good, that we see as perfectly compatible with our identity in Christ. Like, we say, yeah, I've got my identity in Christ, and I've got these other identities, and I feel great about them, and I think they go hand in hand. Some of these competing identities look something like this. I'm a child of God, yeah, and I'm a good dad. I'm a child of God, and I'm a good mom. I'm a child of God, and I'm a good grandma or grandpa. I'm a child of God, and I'm a successful businessman or businesswoman. I'm a child of God, and I'm a community leader. I'm a child of God, and I'm a very smart, well-read, informed person. I'm a child of God, and I'm a person that people generally find attractive. 
I'm a child of God and I'm a theologian. I'm a child of God and I'm a pastor. Satan loves when we have other identities in our core that we see as positive and perfectly compatible with our identity in Christ. We feel like these things go hand in hand. I'm a child of God and I'm all these positive things. But the reality is these two things do not go hand in hand. They are in hand-to-hand combat. They are at war with one another and we don't even know it. We don't even realize and Satan loves that. That's the whole point of this series, right? To help us see the strategies that Satan is using that we are not even aware of. Now, if you're like, what's wrong with saying, I'm a child of God and I'm a good mom. I'm a child of God and I'm a good parent. I'm a child of God and I'm all these other good things. Isn't that what God wants for me to know? And what we're going to see today is that all of those things, those activities are not bad in and of themselves. This sermon is not going to end with me saying, okay, you all need to go become hermits and live in a cave and have no family and no friends and no job and not do anything else with your life, obviously. But what we're going to see is that all those things have got to get moved from the who I am box into the just what I do box. Even those ones that are most core to us need to move from who I am to just something that I do. If that feels like just semantics, if it feels like just like word games, that means that you are likely at risk of Satan using this strategy against you. Because this is the farthest thing from semantics. It is the farthest thing from word games. It is a sweaty, brutal, spiritual struggle that if you want to embrace your identity in Christ, you need to learn to fight for on a daily basis to remove all of these positive things in your life from the identity box and move them to the just something that I do as a child of God box. We're going to look at a passage of scripture where Paul talks to a group of people just like me and just like you who are in this same struggle. They believe in Jesus. They believe in their identity in Christ. They believe they're a child of God, but they've got competing identities as well. The primary competing identity that Paul is going to address with them is their desire to be good Jewish people. The people that he's writing to are a group of people called the Galatians. They lived in a place called Galatia. Paul writes them a letter in the Bible. St. Paul, if you grew up Catholic, that's the guy we're talking about. Paul wrote this letter and he wrote it to the Galatians and guess what that letter is called? Galatians. That's exactly right. So he writes this letter and a big part of the letter is to help them understand that this identity in Christ, being a child of God, is incompatible with their competing identity of being a good Jewish person. Now, we hear this in 2020 and think, wait a minute, so they were trying to follow two different religions at the same time? That doesn't even make any sense. But at the time, this made total sense. The Galatians grew up Jewish. They grew up following Jewish customs and law and ritual and was put in place by God. Before Jesus came, Judaism was established by God as the way that the whole world was supposed to get access to God. So the Jews had access to God through their rituals and religion and all that. And if anybody else wanted to be in right standing with God, they would join the Jewish community and be accepted in by them. So these people saw their Jewish identity as a very, very, very core thing to who they were. So when they became Christians, they said, oh, Jesus is our Messiah. He's our Jewish Savior, which Jesus was. Jesus showed up. He was a Jewish person. He was a Jewish rabbi. He followed Jewish customs and um, rituals and all those kinds of things. But he said, I came to fulfill the law. So I am the Savior of all the Jewish people, but I'm also the Savior of the whole world. And if anybody puts their faith in me, all of their sin, past, present, and future are forgiven. And faith in me is all that you need to be in right standing with God. Now, if you didn't grow up Jewish, you were like, great, sign me up for that. If you grew up Jewish, you were like, great, sign me up for that. But I think I still want to keep being a good Jewish person. I think I still want to keep following the Jewish laws. I think I need to keep trying to live up to the standard. I feel like I keep, I, w- I should keep following these rituals and all of these kinds of things. So this Jewish audience that Paul was talking to had their identity in Christ, and then they had this other competing identity of I need to be a good Jewish person. This is the moment that Paul reaches out and speaks into their situation. 
We cannot read the whole book of Galatians. It's kind of all one big thought, but it would take like a half hour just to read, and it's chilly up here. So, And I know that you all have things to do, so we're just going to zoom in on one particular part of how Paul addresses this reality that they've got their identity in Christ, and then they've got this other competing identity. Here is what Paul says. Paul's like, yo, Galatians, before the coming of this faith, meaning before Jesus showed up, before he died on the cross, was buried, and rose again, before you enjoyed the faith that you now have, we were held in custody under the law until the faith that was to come would be revealed. Paul doesn't start his argument by saying, you can't be a good Jewish person and a good, Jew and a good Christian person because these are two different religions, although that's true. What Paul says is, hey, don't you remember what it was like when you were trying to be a good Jewish person and follow the Jewish law? That's what he's talking about when he says, we were held in custody under the law. That's the Jewish law that they were trying to follow. He said, we were locked up until, until the faith that was to come would be revealed. He said, so the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might justify by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. What Paul is saying is that these two identities, just like we said, are actually at war with each other. I don't know how this landed for every single one of his readers, but I know that a lot of them went, oh yeah, that is what it was like. Throughout this whole letter of Galatians, Paul talks about when the Galatians were trying to live up to that Jewish standard, that Jewish law, it enslaved them. That Jewish identity, tune in here, tune in here. That Jewish identity came with an enslaving standard. Yes, God put it in place, but he put it in place in some ways for it to be replaced when the time was right for Jesus to come. That Jewish identity of trying to live up to Jewish law came with an enslaving standard that they could never live up to. There was hundreds of Jewish laws, over 600. And then there was all these different interpretations of how should you follow them if you really wanted to be a good Jewish person. And no one could agree on the interpretation. So these people would try and try and try to live up to the standard of Jewish law, and they would fail and fail and fail. And when they failed, they would fall apart on the inside because their whole identity was threatened. So Paul says, you think... You can try to follow these laws again and embrace your identity as a child of God? That's not going to work at all because the identity as a child of God frees you to live as God would have you live. And this Jewish identity has always enslaved you. Now, some of you are thinking, okay, but like I see how trying to live up to the standard of Jewish law would enslave me. But you're saying... My identity as a parent enslaves me? My identity as a leader enslaves me? My identity as all these positive things in my life enslaves me? That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is just saying this Jewish identity will enslave you and this Christian identity will free you. But check it out. Paul does not stop there. He says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. That's the identity in Christ part, right? He says, in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ and then he just says one of the most extreme statements they could have possibly imagined hearing at that moment he says there is neither Jew nor Gentile he completely erases this category of identity he doesn't say minimize your Jewish identity or minimize your Gentile identity he says there is no Jew or Gentile in Christ. Now clearly Paul knows and he's not saying that there literally aren't Jewish ethnicity people or Jewish religious people or Gentile non-Jewish people. Paul knows that and Paul has so many positive things to say about the Jewish people and Paul actually has other parts of scripture where he said that there are promises of God that are for the Jewish people that are still relevant even after Christ. So this isn't Paul being racist or trying to erase Jewish people from existence at all. But what Paul is saying to these Jewish Christians is he's saying, if you want to really embrace your identity in Christ, you need to go into that big square box that says my identity and erase Jew. 
right? Because that's the one that comes with that enslaving standard. But then look what he says next. He says, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. Then he says, neither slave nor free. What? Now, again, Paul's not saying there's no such thing as a slave or there's no such thing as a free person at all. But he's saying when it comes to that box where you keep your identity, if you're a slave, you need to erase that from your identity. And if you're free, you need to erase that from your identity. Then he takes it to, like, the most extreme level you could ever imagine. He says, no is male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Again, Paul is not saying there's no such thing as a man and there's no such thing as a woman. That is not what he is saying at all, and don't think that that's what he means by that. Paul believed that there were men and women, but he says, when it comes to your identity in Christ, anything else that goes in your identity box needs to be erased. Nothing else is allowed in that box, even male or female, besides the reality that you are a loved, accepted child of God. Now, he doesn't, like, say, okay, you can't be Jewish or Gentile or slave or free or male or female, but anything else you want to put in that box, you're free to. No, he's saying all these categories to paint that big picture. Nothing else is allowed in that box. Well, why? Well, in the flow of thought through this whole section, what Paul is saying is that in the same way Jewish law comes with an enslaving standard that nobody can ever live up to, everything else that you put into that identity box will come with an enslaving standard that you can never live up to. I need to be a good mom comes with an enslaving standard that you can never live up to. I need to be a good dad comes with an enslaving standard that you can never live up to. I'm not saying you shouldn't try to be a good dad, but I'm saying identity is good dad or good mom. That comes with an enslaving standard that you can never live up to that will rob you of your identity in Christ. I need to be a successful business leader. That comes with an enslaving standard that you know. You've never been able to live up to that. I need to be a good leader. That comes with an enslaving standard that you will never be able to live up to. I need to be a smart, well-read person. That comes with an enslaving standard that you will never be able to live up to. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with being a leader or a mom or a boss or a dad or whatever. But when that thing comes into your identity, According to Paul, you are saying yes to a life of slavery. Let me show you what I mean. I have some uh, basketballs back here. As many of you know, I'm a huge baller. This is one of my favorite pastimes. I know that not all of you can see me, but um, those of you who can are like, he looks like he's never dribbled a basketball before in his life. And you are almost right. I'm very unathletic. I had friends who would um, have me just shoot free throws while they were watching just so they could laugh at me trying to shoot free throws because it looked so funny. That's not the point of the story. That has nothing to do with where we're going, but I just wanted to share that with you. But think about this. Basketball, nothing wrong with basketball. Christians are free to play basketball anytime they want. But if a Christian's identity becomes basketball, they will be enslaved by basketball. I'm trying to start with a silly example because I want to show you how this works with something that probably isn't a struggle for anybody in this parking lot so that your heart can be open to the reality for some ways that you may actually be in this struggle. I had a friend, I have a friend, a guy named Andy, who's in his uh, early 20s now. When he was in middle school and high school, his identity was basketball. He was like, I'm gonna be a professional basketball player I'm going to be famous, the best, I'm going to, I'm going to practice every second, every day, and he did. He was on the middle school basketball team, he was at every practice, he, he gave it his all, he gave it his whole heart, um, you know, he'd come home from practice and practice more, shooting threes, trying to shoot threes, he was so intense about it that his dad told him, you know, 90s basketball was like Michael Jordan. That was like the really good basketball, and the guys today are just not nearly as good. 
So he didn't watch the basketball that was on TV. He only watched reruns of 90s basketball so he could have a pure, unadulterated view of basketball. Now, if you had asked him, are you a Christian? He would say, absolutely. I would say, is your identity in Christ? Do you believe you're a child of God? He would say, absolutely. And I believe that it was. But his identity was also in basketball. So he gets into high school. He's on the team. According to him, he was one of the best players on the team. You never really know when people say those kinds of things. But according to him, he was one of the best. Then, this is like in a small town in Wisconsin. The coach has some relatives who are in high school on the team that he likes better than Andy. And Andy gets benched. Now, what do you think that did to his emotional world? It destroyed it, filled with anger and bitterness and frustration and rage. And he hates the coach and he hates his teammates and he hates himself and he's struggling. Who am I? What is my life? What am I meant to be? He falls apart. Now, at that moment, if someone had said, Andy, but you're a child of God, he would have said, I don't care. It doesn't matter because my identity has also been in basketball and that identity just got destroyed. Now, nothing wrong with basketball. Absolutely nothing wrong with basketball. But when it became his identity, it came with an enslaving standard. And that standard included, at the very least, being able to play in high school. So when he didn't live up to that standard, his emotions fell apart, his mind fell apart, his actions fell apart, he started getting into bad stuff, all because he let Satan take something good and cause it to become a competing identity that enslaved him. Now you hear this as an adult, and you're like, what an idiot. He should have known that he never should have put his whole sense of value and self-worth into something like basketball. But you know what? I think we all still do this. I think we do the very same thing in our 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s. We take good things and we put our value and our sense of self-worth into them. We take good things in our life, we write them into our identity box, this is who I am, and we become enslaved by them. Listen, parenting, I'm not a parent, all, all my friends are parents, parenting is hard. It is hard work if your identity is in Christ and you have no competing identities. But if being a good parent is part of your identity, parenting becomes impossible. It becomes impossible. When I was like six years old, I went to my dad and I said, Dad, I hate you. I wish you weren't my father. And in fact, you're not my father. I just declared it. I thought somehow that would make it come to be. Now, I don't know how my dad responded. I don't even remember this moment. It's just a funny story that we tell in my family. But if my dad's identity had been I'm a good dad that my kid loves. Well, in that moment, he's going to start to feel out of control. He's either going to start to get mad or he's going to start to get fearful or he's going to start to feel sad, whatever it is, because that identity in that moment would be threatened. He would be not living up to the standard that he set for himself. The same thing is true at work, right? You're like, if you're like, I'm a child of God, but I'm also a successful businessman. Well, how much money do you need in the market? to live up to that standard that you've set for yourself as part of your identity that you're a successful business person. 10 grand? Well, no, that sounds a little low, right? Okay, how about 100 grand? You're like, yeah, if I could get there, I'd be successful. Well, let me tell you, when people get to 100 grand, it doesn't feel successful anymore, and they gotta go higher. A million, there's no amount of money that if your identity is, I need to be financially successful, you will never reach the standard where you can see Oh, I have made it. You will be enslaved to being a successful business person because any identity that is in your identity box will enslave you. Some of you are like, okay, these are like really basic 
basic ice examples. I, I don't have anything like that. Well, listen, some of the more subtle and more sophisticated ones enslave worse than any. Like some of you feel like, I'm a Christian and I'm a thoughtful, intelligent person. And you feel like that's fine. But it's, without you even realizing, it's crept into your identity. It's part of how you define yourself. It's part of who you need to be. Well, what happens when you're at a social event, a little cocktail party, and there's somebody in the room who um, people are perceiving as smarter than you? Do you like them? No, you hate them. You go up there and you start quoting from books you've never even read just to try to get people in the room to think you're smart. Why? Because that is your identity. Listen, I wrestle with this just as much as any of you. My identity in Christ is I am a child of God. Do you know what the competing identity that Satan tries to tell me is who I am? A pastor. You'd think being a child of God and being a pastor would go hand in hand. No. Satan gets me more through anything than by telling me, Vince, you are a good pastor. And I go, yeah, that's who I am. I'm a good pastor. Well, you know what happens? Somebody shoots me an email after a message and says, that sermon was horrible. No one's actually done that, by the way. But, you know, you get criticism. Every pastor gets criticism. When my identity is in being a good pastor, that criticism knocks me down. I get super angry or I get super anxious. Or I get fearful. Whatever it is. Why? Because I, I let pastor become part of my identity, which means living up to some standard that I set in my mind. And when I don't live up to that standard, I am enslaved emotionally, and spiritually, and in my actions. Any identity besides child of God will enslave you. It will distract you. It will bring your attention away from the one identity that fills you with confidence and humility and emotional wholeness and emotional well-being. Anything else that you allow to be something that defines you will enslave you. This is the beauty of the gospel. Because child of God is the one identity that will not enslave you. Because it's a gift from the outside. It's God bestowing it on you when you deserve it least. It's God giving you value when you feel worthless. It's God giving you love when you feel unlovable. If God bestowed on you this label, child of God, when you had done nothing to deserve it, well, you know, I never have to worry about living up to any kind of standard to be accepted by God because he gave me this identity when I was farthest from him. I'm loved by God at my worst. I have nothing to live up to. I have no standard to live up to. I have nothing to shoot for. I have nothing to fall away from. It is just a gift, an unmerited, undeserved gift from God on your life. It is the one identity that will not enslave you, but will set you free. And it is the only identity you need. It is the only way to define yourself. Closing thought, and this is the most beautiful part of this whole thing. When your identity is only in Christ, you become the kind of person who is ready for everything else. There is no parent as well equipped as the parent who says, Oh, parenting? That's not who I am. That's just what I do, but I'm a child of God. That's my identity. I'm not a parent. Parenting is a role God's given me for the moment. It's not who I am. It's just what I do, but who I am is a child of God. There's no business leader as well equipped to lead their company as the business leader who says, Oh, running this business? That's not who I am. That's just something that I do, but you know who I am? I'm a child of God. Now all the business stuff isn't personal. It's not wrapped up in their emotions, in their value. They're now able to think clearly about the best thing to do for the business because it's not wrapped up in who they are. Man, I'll tell you the same thing is true for pastors. 
the same thing is true for me. I am at my best in leading and discipling and preaching. When I go, I'm not a pastor. I'm a child of God. Pastor's a role that God gave me for this season, for this moment. I don't know what I'll be doing in 40 years. But for now, it's the role that God has given me, and that's all it is. It's not who I am. It's just what I do. Make sense? Okay, so here's some real practical, one real practical phrase I want to leave you with. Because like I said, this is a battle you have to fight day after day after day after day. It is not a one-time thing where like, okay, now I realize I'm not all these other things. I'm just a child of God, and now my emotions are in a great place, and it's all rainbows and sunshine. No. It is a battle you have to keep reminding yourself again and again. The way you can figure out you are letting Satan bring in a competing identity is when you feel anxious or angry, and it feels disproportionate from the situation. Like it's a struggle with your kid or your spouse or your work or your finances or whatever. And you're like, I probably shouldn't be this mad or this fearful about this moment. In that moment, what you do is you ask yourself, is there a competing identity that I've allowed to be defining who I am? Have I made my identity good parent, good, good spouse, good worker, good employee, good leader, good thinker, whatever? Is there part that feels threatened in this moment. Then in that moment, you tell yourself, erase and embrace. Erase and embrace. Erase and embrace. Remember the identity box? Picture it in your heart like there's a whiteboard on your heart. And you say, oh, right now I feel like part of my identity is being a good whatever. Erase. Erase it. And then embrace your true identity as a child of God. Erase the identity of, I need to be a good spouse or else I have no worth. Nope. Erase it and embrace your identity as child of God. When you're like not sure what to do in that work situation and you go, do I feel so anxious because I feel like I have to be the successful person to have worth and value? If you do, erase, erase that identity and embrace your identity as a child of God. Erase and embrace. Erase and embrace. embrace. Burn it in your mind. Write it on a piece of paper. Write it down. Send yourself a text. Send yourself a note or whatever. You say, I'm going to live as a child of God and a child of God alone. And the way I'm going to do that, I'm going to erase and embrace. I'm going to erase and embrace. I'm going to erase every other identity and I'm going to embrace my one true identity as a child of God. Amen? Amen. And amen. Amen. I'm going to take those beeps as amens. Praise the Lord. I am, uh, I'm going to pray. But next week, we are going to look at another one of Satan's strategies to rob us of our identity in Christ. Today we talked about that he'll introduce a competing identity that gets our mind all over the place. right? But there are lots of other strategies that he uses to get us off of that one true identity that caused us to be effective, confident, humble people. So come back next week or two next week for Identity Theft Part 2. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for everybody here. We love you, God. We thank you that you've given us an identity that cannot be tarnished. It cannot be stolen. It cannot be ruined because it was given by the grace of your Son, Jesus, on the cross. But God, we know that we can miss it, we can forget it, we can get distracted from it. So Lord, help our eyes to be fixed on you every single day in everything that we do. We love you, God, and we ask that you bless the weeks of everybody in this parking lot, everybody watching online. We're grateful for you, Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody honked and said amen. Have a good day. We love you so much. We'll see you next week.